Yeah, so I didn't really have a choice. I mean, I was gonna be a ski bum. I mean, the first day in the backcountry, I was 11 days old, and I think 10 months later, uh, we were doing our first backcountry trip. So because of my parents, I got to fall in love with the mountains, and you know, it's given me so much. I mean, the mountains are the place that I call home, and it's the place where I feel at peace, and I've catered my entire life around them. And you know, as I grow older, I see how, you know, our, us in the outdoor community, you know, we get to take our hobbies, our fun, our passions from the mountains, but if it's just a one-way street, then we're extracting from them, and there's no reciprocal relationship with the places we play. And so a few years ago, we started a nonprofit called Be On Boarding, and it was basically we were trying to enact that responsibility to the mountains, to the environment, and the people that have been stewarding the environment for over thousands of years. And so, you know, growing up in the snowboard community, you're always surrounded by the word radical. So you're like, oh, there's a radical line, oh, there's a radical trick over there. And, you know, to me, it always meant like going to the extremes. But more recently, in working uh, closely with communities that are fighting for their land, you see that word be used against people in a very negative light. And, you know, to me, that labeling diminishes why people would stand up in the first place and what these people are actually fighting for. Snowboarding has changed my entire life. It's given me so much. It's given me the opportunity to develop self-esteem, grow as a human being, but also travel, meet a lot of amazing people all over the world. Yeah, I'm very grateful that I've been able to partner with sponsors and movie projects that have done more than just showing some progressive snowboarding, which is super cool but like for me in the last few years I wanted to hopefully spread a message that I think is super urgent right now. Life is so short and I feel like a big part of life and purpose is to give back. The area where I want to give back for me is tackling this environmental crisis. When I learn about this project, I knew that Danny would be a good person to talk to. All the time I would ask him questions about his work and then he would tell me about these stories or these challenges that they're working on about the Hoisten community and how they've been working for years to fight for their land and the resources they've lost since BC Hydro put the dams in. Located three hours north of Vancouver, the Bridge River Valley is home to the Hoistin, resilient people who have lived off their territory for over 10,000 years. Beginning in the 1940s, their beloved Bridge River was dammed not once but twice by BC Hydro, resulting in the loss of more than two-thirds of their valley, wiping out wildlife corridors and the spawning and rearing grounds of three species of Pacific salmon that they hold sacred. 
Since BC Hydro has begun breaking their agreed upon water management levels, the Hoistin have been forced to take matters into their own hands before it's too late. They hired ecologists to work with the community to create and maintain fish habitats where the salmon can have a chance of survival during these tragic spill events. Uh, the impacts from the dams, uh, loss of our habitat areas, our, our food areas, our food fish. Bridge River community were the first impacted by uh, damming of the river. We lost our fish, we lost the water, and uh, we were the last ones to benefit from them. We, got, we didn't get hydropower until 1974. They talk about salmon being 60% of our diet back in the time. They used to have thousands of salmon trying on the racks on the banks of the Fraser. Two years ago, we didn't do any. How do you teach or pass on that culture to your younger ones? In that time frame, it doesn't work. Historically, we used to be able to spend a lot more time, you know, teaching about the benefits of the fish and the importance of this fish to our, our livelihood. It's a real way of life that's lost. Uh, working with a consultant company, uh, Coldstream. We partnered up with them to, to do uh, work on the Lower Bridge River to basically look at the fish and learn more about it and then to help the, the fish that are there. In 2016 and 2017, they went well above, it's called the water use plan, and the flows exceeded the original plan by more than 50 CMS and in some years over 100 CMS. This is cubic meters per second. Per second. So prolonged periods of time with high levels of turbidity, juvenile fish can't feed because they can't see anything because there's so much silt and the flows are never supposed to reach above 15 or 20 CMS. And since then they broke that agreement and the water's been pushed out up to 120 CMS last year, and this year it could reach up to 300, it's being predicted. Wow. Really, it's a BC dictatorship. You know, we're supposed to be co-managing the system. To me, you know, it had really failed in that aspect. Unfortunately, since they've started um, having to spill the water in the summer, we've seen the populations decline by 70 to 80 percent. We are very concerned that these three species of Pacific salmon may not uh, be in this river valley in, in, say, five years' time. PC Hyder come to us and said that they are not into salmon. They, they don't look after salmon. Our chiefs back then basically told, uh, told them you aren't into the fish business, you're into the fish killing business. We could be telling the story of three species of Pacific salmon going extinct in this river valley. And I don't want to tell that story to my daughter. I don't want to just collect data for, for five more years. Now is the time that we need to take that information and use it. And so that's why we're focused on restoration efforts. So this is the Blue Nose Restoration Site, and this is uh, the area we'll be working on for the next few days. And what we're going to do is uh, begin to open this bottom section, which is presently disconnected to the main stem of the river. And what it'll do is open up some juvenile rearing habitat, especially during the high flow events. The salmon need an area where they can find refugia to get away from the high flows. This past year, when we did the salvaging efforts, we found over 400 salmon in this. Just in this little area? Just in this little area. Wow. And there is coho, chinook, um, steelhead, bull trout, all using the same habitat. And so for juvenile, it's like essential to have these? Yes, part completely, because the... this is where they kind of relax, feed, grow a bit bigger, and then once they're ready to go, they they migrate out. I used to think that like hydro was somewhat like the better option, the green way to generate power. And I, I've come to discover in the last few years that it's not the case at all, but still a majority of the public thinks that 
hydropower power is green, what would you say to the public as a biologist? What people don't realize is the, the impacts it has on the aquatic ecosystems, that moose or deer or any wildlife is dependent on. It's all interconnected. We understand the need for, for power and energy, but I think the whole thing is the mismanagement, the lack of accountability that major corporations have. We've always been stewards of this river. This river sustained our, you know, people with its fish and its bears and its berries and its sheep and like we ate all the food and so what we give back is the protection of it. So I just consider the, the Hoitian as the stewards of this river. Everything that we do, all the projects that we participate on in this civilization, they all have impacts. We need to enforce and come to the table and say that every single project that we undertake has to contribute to the enhancement of ecosystems and in, in this case the um, survival of three species of Pacific salmon. And we need all the help that we can get um, as a community and we need all the help that we can get as a society. And if more money was focused on creating a restoration economy uh, I think we could really turn the tables around and, and create a new paradigm. this experience, I feel that reclamation work guided by indigenous communities is a path forwards to not only saving the wild salmon, but also righting the wrongs of the past. After spending time with the beautiful Huishtin community, I figured we had to get up into the mountains and glacier that feed the Bridge River. It was just so cool to be snowboarding in these incredible mountains and to know that this snow would one day soon end up as water flowing down the Bridge River. It just really hammered home how interconnected it all is and how much we need to protect this incredible gift we've been blessed with.
Yeah, I first went to Iskut five years ago and people call it the sacred headwaters. I had never seen a landscape that was so untouched and you could go on top of a mountain and you could look out and you didn't see any clear cuts and you didn't see any mines or pipelines. It was amazing to see that land so intact. When I met the people who belonged to that land, it really solidified that I was gonna keep coming back there. Now it's more than just making films and being on the front lines. It's a friendship in which we're actually learning from the elders and from the knowledge keepers who are in Iskit and it's totally changed my perspective on, on how I look at my surroundings and it's brought me down and kind of rooted me back in the ground. My first impression of Tamil and Jasper was that they were approaching issues in a very ethical means, that they were traveling around in a, in a bus powered by biofuels, walking the talk. I think it's been like seven years now. We've been driving our car on waste French fire grease, and uh, it's a little greasy, but it's definitely worth it. This is actually how we stay in shape. If you pump enough grease, you'll be in shape for surfing. They weren't just out to uh, make new first descents with snowboards. They were always very concerned about local community issues, uh, continually figuring out ways to be of service to the local community wherever they went. When I first met you guys, uh, I thought you guys were pretty cool. I'm like, here's these crazy, crazy people that just, they basically live off the land like our old ancestors. They're not scared of being out in the cold. They travel everywhere in the, in the bushes, and I'm just like, oh my god. All we did was tour today, it was beautiful. Saw a couple tarm again. Nice to be on the trail. Pretty beautiful trail. It's pretty epic. Lots of old markings on the trees. Tracked a lot of kilometers down, down the trail. This bet's easy on our way to Coldfish and couldn't help but think all day about the people who have traveled this trail and thousands of years people have been hunting and trapping on this trail. Just about to go to bed here in a beautiful zone and it's really cold. Ready to crawl into the frosty bag. Well, last night, couldn't feel my foot all night. My left foot, I was poking it. <laughs> no sensation. Oh, no. But it doesn't falling. seem to be black, which is a good sign. And now today, it feels like I'm skiing on an icicle. We lost the trail amongst the thick willow. A little bit of frostbite. Started to head back. <laughs> It's a little bit of a understatement on the little bit of frostbite. We got a decent amount of frostbite. <laughs> Everyone's got a bit. I feel extremely grateful to spend time with Tamu whenever I can, and I'm, a lot of people don't even know how incredible of a snowboarder he is. But the reality of it is that he's put snowboarding on the side to fight for something that's more important, and I really admire that. How's the day going there, bud? Having a good time. Back on the sticks. I love the mountains. It's such a privilege to be able to go explore them through snowboarding and splitboarding. And seven and a half years ago, I first came to the Taltan territory to check out some of the mountains here to do some riding. And you know, during that trip, I was invited in to help support the fight against a coal mining company in the headwaters of the Skeena River. And so, you know, seven and a half weeks later on a blockade, you develop some pretty serious inspiration and friendships. And so I've been back every year since then. So you could say snowboarding brought me here in the first place, but it's really the relationships and a love that's grown for the land, uh, the people here and the youth that keep me coming back. It's good, 2017, it's field trip time. Tamo and Jasper have taken up roles with the youth to help get the youth out on the land and experience the, the bush in ways that their their parents just don't have time to because they're working. The kids think of what Tamo and Jasper do is pretty cool. They love it. They adore those two. Every day my kid will come home 
and one of their names will pop up in their story or whatever. So they're, they're like heroes to our kids. Like I help them any way I can. Beautiful work taking them out, asking me along, it's just a privilege. You know? The Tall Tan community of Iskit is located in the headwaters of the Iskit River, which flows west into the Stikine, one of the largest salmon-bearing rivers in North America. Permitted by the government, yet without the community's consent, mineral exploration and drilling has been moving forwards in the surrounding watershed. Recently, large copper and gold veins were discovered mere kilometers from town. The companies Colorado Resources and Skeena Resources Limited are actively working to expand their operations. Right over there is where Iskit is. Uh, we've just been working with the community and um, that actually ridge right there is proposed by uh, a mine by a company called Colorado. Tailing Pond would actually um, displace Iskit. So, kind of pretty heartbreaking for us and a lot of the community, but there's lots of folks organizing it around it. And it's kind of an exciting time to see what's going to happen next. This is our traditional territory and we're not going to allow this. Look at that lake. Who's going so, to pollute so, it? So, Would I come into your backyard and ruin something for your grandkids no, and no, your no. kids? John, exploration is very early stage. It's right? not, no, I don't never, care. There's no exploration. You guys got two days to get out of here. I've been here 55 years. Now I understand what my grandfather talked about. We're rich. Look at this. We're rich. Sure, we don't have the money, but we're rich. We're rich in all this nature. Rich with the food that brings us. How could they come and just act like it's going to be all right to destroy this? Not just buy our home. Our home is not this one spot right here. Everyone would look at it and say, that's my home. This whole area, our parents, our grandparents lived on. They walked the trails here and there. This whole area is their home. It wasn't once pinpoint on the ground. Look, right where a creek coming out. What the hell? Too much to be lost here. We're doing it peacefully. Our elders would have came and threw you out of here. Got your plans here. We're not too happy with this company being here. Look over there. That's my home, right? Over there. Oh, it is a beautiful area. Would I come and dig in your backyard? Drill holes in your backyard? No, you don't. We live too close to here. How do I explain to my grandson that I allow it to happen? I can't. There's mines all around us, okay? But have one right in your back door, you know? I open my back door and there they are. And to let a mine go there? Wow, what's gonna happen to Iska? What's gonna happen to all our water that runs into the Don't End, the John, Tataga, Kinniscan, Natadaslin, right on down the Iska River? Before my camp was here, my grandpa camped here. I was told by a few elders, this is where he camped. This is my roots. That's why my camp sits here. As Aboriginal people from our area, this is our root. And for people to come in and want to rip up that root, they're ripping up your home, your bloodline to the land. I really can't see our culture with snow, mountains, trees clean water, or the animals running in. I just can't see it. That's why it's for us to protect. We gotta fight for our 
territory, our land. Because right now, that's all we have. Money means nothing when it comes to the land. After we went up there and told you what we were going to do, we had a community meeting. Yeah. And this is with the Iskut ban, and this is the result of it. Right. Yeah. This is your eviction notice. Uh, well, like I told you, John, again, you know, some of the things that you're, you're talking about, I really can't solve. You know, I, I'm just, I'm here doing a job, and that's kind of where I'm well, at. Your job is going to have to leave this area. It's too close to our community. You guys got no damn business up that Zaytou Creek. Our drinking water. What are you Frickle. doing about our drinking water? Oh, that's not your drinking water. That's Pitting our water drinking right water. It's flowing your, right down to the reserve. Your property right above our our reserve. We have a future here, but you don't. You don't with them with your company up there. This is our future. What are you gonna do with your tailing ponds when you get going up there like Redcrest? Your 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 way. Your, yeah, because that's that's what happened with Redcrest. Oh, you're way ahead of the game, and look look where they are now. Okay, well, what I'll, what I'll do is I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give this to you, this uh, declaration to the management of the company, and uh, I can discuss that with them. We'll complete this program, and then we can have a series of consultations for what happens in the future. Let's see your respect and leave up there, because that place where you go up, where you made trail up there, our elders used to go up there. Our ancestors go up there and hunt. The right. elders here say no. Yeah. We don't want it. We don't want it because you hear what John say about our grandkids. Mm -hmm. They come after us mm -hmm. or before us. We don't want it. It's just like uh, like you, your own self. You got grandkids. Think about that. Guarantee you, I'm coming back. Mm -hmm. We'll all be there. We'll all be there. Okay, thank you very much. so we can make it to Terrace. Moon shines bright, moon shines bright. Keeps our spirits lit and our heads held high. Round and around the bottle gets light. I guess I'll rest my bones right here for the night. Old times are told
en route to the Broughton Archipelago, which is the territory of the Muskmog Zawadanik and the Numgees. About six years ago, our family was adopted into the community in the Numgees, and it's always really special to go back. I've been going back every summer since then, and you know, it's a really intense time right now. These communities have been fighting fish farms for over 30 years, and no one has listened. Fish farms arrived on the west coast of BC in the 1970s. These industrial feedlots raise Atlantic salmon in the Pacific Ocean. Each farm contains up to 1.5 million fish, and it releases billions of tons of feces, viruses, and sea lice directly into the open ocean. 80% of BC farm salmon in our supermarkets are infected with the highly contagious Norwegian heart virus, PRV, that is spread to wild salmon and causes HSMI, which weakens the heart of wild salmon, preventing them from making it upriver. In the spring of 2018, BC fish farm tenures are up for renewal by the government. We are on the Sir Edmund farm, and last year we were actually on this farm with members of the Muskmog Zawadainik, and they came and served a 72-hour eviction notice, and the farm didn't move. They harvested the fish in it, and now they're restocking. Pretty heartbreaking. I don't know how many times you can ask politely for this industry to leave because they have no consent and because they're an abomination to the wild salmon. The reason why our our culture is so rich is because we had our salmon. We've lived here for 13,000 years and we should know what we're talking about when we say there's something wrong. When we see the sickness in our waters, people need to listen. Fish farms are to salmon, like taking your child through the infectious disease ward in a hospital on her way to school. They absolutely bathe everything in pathogens that are coming and going, and this is simply killing off these ecosystems, emptying the oceans of fish, and highly destructive to everything that depends on the ocean. I grew up in my community, but I also grew up in a residential school, and you know, the residential school era was part of the government assimilation of our people. And that's what I see today, they're still trying to do genocide with our people. And because it's under our water and we don't see the destruction, then it's okay. I think it's a crime. Well, how can you do reconciliation when on one hand you're destroying our territory, there is going to be no reconciliation. Uh, this is an active job site. I'll ask you guys to get back in your boat, please, and for your safety and ours. Yeah, that's it. Say? What does that say? It says traditional territory. There you go. Yeah. And you have never been given rights to be here. So don't tell me to leave. You can step, you, you step you back. Step back. You want to be like that? Be like that. We ain't leaving this place. We're here to do something and we're gonna do it. We're here to protect our land and our waters for our children and our children's children. We've said it in the past. We're here to protect and that's the bottom line. We want these fish farms out. Doing this just shows you that we don't have to be afraid. We do not have to be afraid because we are in the right. We are in the right. I imagine uh, Marine Harvest gave you a call. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, are you guys sticking around for a while? Or? Absolutely. Are you? Absolutely. Okay. How long is your uh, anticipated time? Uh, until, until these farms are gone. They got no respect for our people, they got no respect for our lands, you know, and it's really sad. And it's going to be a great day when we can dance in a big house and celebrate that these fish farms are gone. They're going to say that this is where 
we started to take our power back, to take our lives back, and this is where the pain stopped and we were beginning to heal. Younger generations finally, you know, saying that we need to do something about this. So, we started this occupation uh, August 24th. I just have a newborn niece. She was born a week before I started this. Once she was born, reality really hit, and I knew that she needed a voice for her future. We're out here at the Wicklow Occupation. Uh, just woke up, it's on their fifth day, out here supporting the Muskema Zawadenik. We're just gonna dip the GoPro into the net right beside where everyone's camping out to show what exactly uh, is in these pens. These, these fish are really sick. Uh, these fish are, are polluting the environment uh, that we call home. The images are horrifying. I, I had this incredible sadness. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't keep it in anymore. I, 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 uh, I lost it and I cried. I, I, I normally don't get, uh, get, get like that, but, I, but uh, there was something, there was something really really wrong. Sick to my stomach. Some videos, pictures, but seeing it with my own eyes. It's hard to even describe how I feel for what I'm looking at. If we don't act now, we're going to miss this opportunity, this little window of opportunity to correct the, the mistakes of the past. The time is running out. With so few wild salmon left in those rivers, all those little eggs that are in the gravel right now incubating all the little baby fish inside of there, if they come by and are bathed in Piscean rheovirus and sea lice, they're just not going to exist anymore. I just want to say I've only ever known wild salmon and I know the joy that it brings when you see the wild salmon. And this is one of the most saddest feelings I've had for a long time. The stand that you're taking is necessary. You got to get these things out of here one way or the other. And if it means mobilizing the whole coast, then it should be done. All right, we're en route to Haida Gwaii, just a couple ferries away, and Jasper's got some fun surf spots lined up. And at the end of the month, our good friend Megan O'Brien's gonna be flying up, and pretty excited to see her. She's gonna be finishing a chilcat weaving uh, up in Masset, so here we go.
never been canoe surfing before, that's for sure. We had like an awesome time, a couple really ridiculous bails, but that's just part of the fun. And now I'm hooked, it's my new favorite hobby. Maybe we could, we could uh, propose it for the next Olympics. I need to do it again. <laughs> Surfing on the Northwest Coast is such a special thing because you're surrounded by so much beauty here when you're out in the water and these huge storms and these swells hitting our coast and we get to ride these amazing waves. You know, surfing is what makes me happy, but it also brings me back down to ground level and puts me back in my place, makes me realize that, you know, I'm just a small part of this huge ecosystem and that if I want to keep surfing and camping on the coast and enjoying, you know, wild food, that I've got to stand up for it. people have come from the waters, our culture is made from the waters and lands of the islands here, and so everything's uh, inextricably uh, intertwined. You can't have one thing without the other. That's how we've been taught about our culture, and uh, you could really feel that powerful connection. You cannot separate Haida culture from the land, so-called civilized world, you sort of try to remove yourself from, from the land as much as you can. 
Our experience here is that we depend on the land. That's all we have. You know, that's, that's what we have to fight for. The art is our connection to Haida Gwaii. It has a connection to place, really, and history. The stories that are connected with the art are connected to different places on Haida Gwaii. I try to create these visual images of the supernatural beings. It's almost like a vignette, really. It's a little moment in, in history, in the story. Our art forms have come from the land, and our language comes from the land, and I feel rooted to this place. I feel like I'm not from here, I'm part of it. My ancestors have been here for thousands of years, and they're actually part of the landscape. Their DNA is on these lands. Their DNA is in those trees and, you know, in those fish, and there's no feeling like it. I feel just such, just a responsibility to it. The land means everything to me because uh, without our land, we're nothing. The older I get, the more I realize how much responsibility I carry. And we all carry that responsibility until we have a better future for our children and a better present. It's a strength and a reaffirmation of who we are. It's never been about resisting, it's about keeping alive for our children. With the Haida, it was really close to almost being gone and it's been an incredible journey watching the reawakening of everybody, that hunger. And it's a strength that you have to get past your ego. You know, somebody who's trying to change things is the radical and, and you know, what's been changed is the earth. The earth has been assaulted on all sides, and that's the radical thing that we're up against. It almost doesn't matter who you elect, we still end up having to fight the same fights. You know, it is a fight that we could lose, but it's, uh, it's not an indigenous fight. It's a fight of humanity to try to keep this world. like I was born with like a responsibility. Giving all that I can to something like weaving um, makes me feel like I'm doing my job as a person or like what I came here to do. I was really grateful to have the opportunity to be on Haida Gwaii when I finished the apron that I was working on because I only was surrounded by like a great group of friends and people you know that helped and supported me along the way to finishing that in the last week but I also had um, a couple of my teachers around like Sherry Dick and Carrie Dick. I mean it was just so special just to have them do like a few stitches on it to have like their almost like their blessing and their energy in that piece. I'm so excited, impressed and grateful that she captured what it's all about. Now she understands what the true meaning of Chilkat is and it's reflected in her work. It's wonderful when you when you see somebody take that art form and then bring it up another level and bring it up another level. Level, you know, that's something that uh, makes you feel really good inside. I seen something in her that I guess I recognize in myself. She drives, she's driven by the weaving. You know, the weaving is what takes over. She learned what it meant to become a weaver, and I told her that from the beginning. Anybody can weave, anybody. But it doesn't mean that they're going to be a weaver. And through that, you learn to do things that you never thought were possible. Or what does it feel kind of emotionally practicing something that was almost lost at one point. Oh, jeez. You know, I really hate it when people say that. Something that was lost at one point in time. Mm -hmm. Weaving will never die. When that weaving dies, it's the last time it's mentioned. The last time somebody says the word chunka. It never, ever was close to death. People forget that. That this is something that's been handed down from generation to generation. It didn't take somebody in a museum to take apart a blanket for it to be alive. Chilkat weaving, even though it's performed by an individual, 
and it's worn by an individual, a lot of the times when you hear people speak about it, it's not about the individual. It's telling that story of like a people or of like a family or of a clan, those like supernatural origins, you know, those stories that we carry. And to be able to have it in that place felt really good. Especially it was the first time that I've ever felt how powerful a place can have, like an art form that belongs to a place, you know? It's been nice to guide her throughout the years and see her grow as an artist from just a snowboarder to a weave, cedar bark weaver to being a fine cedar bark weaver to being a raven's tail weaver to being a chill cat weaver and seeing her go through all the stages that she's gone to to get to where she is. I wonder if Megan would attribute some of her connection to nature because of snowboarding. I could see it. Uh, I think that this connection with nature and then this reconnection with her ancestry is something really interesting and very powerful for a lot of people. Both kind of like a action sports perspective and an indigenous perspective. Both of these mentalities, like athlete and maybe athlete and artist or athlete and indigenous artist. I think worldview is so important um, and it's possible to derive the same kind of outcomes or same realizations from both of those approaches. So I think there's the potential like with an athlete in the mountains to to reach some of those same places. And I think intention has so much to do with it. I think, you know, traditionally for our people, the mountains and how we viewed them, I think that perspective, kind of the more centered on what the mountain is and how to engage with it versus it only being like a platform for human performance. You know, and there's really powerful points where those kind of like interfacing elements meet and I think if you're open to that, that holds tremendous potential, you know, for transformation of, of an individual.